Welcome. This is our regularly scheduled Thursday, September 28th, City of Capitola City Council meeting. May we please have a roll call? Councilmember Brooks? Here. Councilmember Clark? Here. Councilmember Peterson? Here. Vice Mayor Brown? Here. And Mayor Kaiser? Here. Would you all join in the Pledge of Allegiance? Thank you. Before we continue on with the meeting, I just wanted to make a quick statement. Um, we have all read and heard about some recent uh, comments at public meetings that include racist and anti-Semitic slurs. We see these efforts as an attack on the public agency's ability to conduct public meetings. We want you to know that we're aware and that we plan to continue to conduct the people's business to the best of our ability. We will comply with the First Amendment and the Brown Act while enforcing the limitations of both. As your mayor, I want you to know that these comments do not represent any values of Capitola. Capitola is a place of inclusivity, diversity, and community, and we intend to keep it that way. And as our favorite city manager would say, happy Capitola. So thank you. Uh, that will bring us down to item two, additions and deletions. Great. And we have a few presentations this evening, item three. Um, the first one this evening is going to be presented by me. It is a mayor's proclamation for George Whitman. Um, okay, excuse me while I get all this lingo. So today we gather to remember and honor a beloved member of our Capitola community. Mr. George Whitman, who passed away on August 5th, 2023, was first visited, had first visited California or Capitola in 1948, eventually marrying his wife Cheryl at the Boathouse Restaurant on the Esplanade in 1981, congratulations, and purchasing a home in Capitola in 1983. George dedicated 38 years of his life to health and physical education at local school and schools and participated and directed in many regional foot races, such as the Wharf to Wharf race. Even in retirement, Joy, George remained active in his community, volunteering his time at New Brighton Middle School, and since 2013 at the Capitola Historical Museum, where he delighted visitors with his extensive knowledge and personal travel stories. George and Cheryl embraced the sense of community in Capitola and loved to participate and attend Capitola's events, including the Art and Wine Festival, the Begonia Festival, the Car Show, and the Halloween Parade, the summer music and dance nights as well. George's warm presence, passion for life, and dedication to the Capitola community have left an incredible mark on all of those who had the privilege of knowing him. I, Margo Kaiser, the mayor of the city of Capitola, along with the city council and the entire Capitola community, do proclaim a heartfelt gratitude for George's unwavering commitment to our town and express condolences to his family and friends. If you'd like to come up and get this, you're more than welcome to. If anybody of the family wants to say anything, you're welcome to as well. No? Okay, yeah, of course. Okay, yeah, we do too. Yeah, thank you so much. All right, and we are now having a presentation on our Junior Guard Participant Recognition Awards. Pardon me. Good evening, Mayor and Council. This year, we had the pleasure of impacting just over 1,000 children, ranging from 6 to 18 years old. 
having our main goal to give a progressive outlook for children to learn and grow within our ocean-going community. We achieved this in a couple of ways, more specifically through personal and professional development, physical training, uh, competition, ocean safety, and emergency preparation. Personal development comes in the form of recognizing one's own physical and mental boundaries, pushing past those boundaries to achieve higher goals than previously conceived. One of the biggest things we teach is confidence. Confidence in your physical abilities, social abilities, and bringing the, that notion into your everyday life. Physical training is often utilized to find those boundaries and give a practical, sorry, a practical balance of getting stronger, faster, and more physically adept for life's obstacles. That combined with skills practice allows for participants to become well-versed within the ocean-going community. Competition is then utilized as an outlet for the competitive spirit to foster in allowing lifeguards and junior guards to test their skills on a local, regional, national, and international level harboring rich lifeguard culture, and pushing our physical boundaries. Debatably, the most important thing that we teach is ocean safety. Being aware of hazards, conditions, and how to enjoy the ocean to the fullest extent and in a safe manner. This allows our junior guards to grow in our program and ensure their safety with it. It also allows for our community as a whole to be positively affected and allows knowledge to spread through our town and how we operate in what can often be treacherous waters. Lastly, we teach a wide array of emergency preparation. Our junior guards are taught recognition of those in need, appropriate forms of action. And one thing that's important to note is that not all of our guards will become police officers, firefighters, but all of our junior guards will become members of our community. And what our program so greatly teaches is that how to act appropriately and uh, we can prepare them to face everyday dangers and situations with a level head, calm, rational thinking, alleviating panic, which so often makes situations worse. You can do the next slide. So each session, we give out four division-wide awards. These include the best sport, most improved, team captain, and best all around. Each of these awards are self-explanatory, but are all earned within their respected age division and sought after by all the participants within it. You can do the next slide as well. As you can see, we have a wide range of age groups and each of them have really put in their best effort to get these awards. Into our last slide, our second to last slide. Um, and then each slide, or sorry, the last thing on our agenda is our beachwide awards. These awards are given out once to twice a year to participants highlighting their presence on the beach. Junior guards compete for these awards across the entire beach, regardless of age divisions. This includes the Iron Man and Iron Woman, which is given to top competitors and athletes who push themselves and others to compete at the highest level. The final award we give out is the Dory Award. If you don't know who Dory is, I strongly recommend that you do some research on who she is. Um, she has impacted this community and Capitola to the fullest extent and truly embodies tenacity and selflessness. Um, for some context, she was running a newly founded program in the 1980s while being eight months pregnant. So with that, I would like to invite up our Iron Man and Iron Woman, uh, Mario Talavera and Xander Brown for a photo op with the mayor and council.
And lastly, I would like to invite up our Dory Award recipient, Bradley Schwarz, for a photo and certific certificate of recognition from our mayor. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. I just want to um, just take a minute to recognize that these individuals that we um, recognize here in chambers, as Brennan had talked about, these are the individuals for us to keep an eye on in our community. Um, most often, the individuals that achieve these awards become Capitola staff at some point. So thank you. We'll be lucky if that happens. So congratulations, you guys. Thank you so much. Um, any other words from council? Or they come and actually take our spots up here as future <laughs> council members. So um, don't hesitate to fill out our mayor of the day um, competition that we have going, up, uh, going on here. While you're out of the water, you can take <laughs> some time to write that essay. Congratulations. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay, we have another presentation uh, this evening. It is from Visit Santa Cruz. Yes, I might need to be turned on. Right here? Okay. <clears throat> Thank you so much for having me. My name is Terrence Kincannon, and I'm starting my second month as the Chief Executive Officer for Visit Santa Cruz County. Can't tell you how excited I am to be here. So I know I only have eight minutes, and what I have is about 17 slides, so I might talk a little bit fast. But this slide right here just lets you know who I am. Uh, I have over 24 years of experience in tourism and hospitality. I uh, was a former hotelier down in the Pismo Beach in San Luis Obispo County area, and then went uh, and became president for uh, Go Lake Havasu in Lake Havasu City for six years where I got an amazing education, and now I'm back here in the Central Coast, could not be happier. And not just because it's not 119 here like it is in Lake Havasu City. Really happy to be back in this community. So I want to let you know that we're going to have a fresh look at visit uh, Santa Cruz County. Um, I can't read the notes I have up there, but uh, I do know that we are. Go I'm going to engage with each, with each. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> now we're talking. Um, I just want to let you know that I'm plan doing. Uh, I'm huge on engagement. In fact, at my board meeting yesterday, I gave a list of all the people that I've had the pleasure of interacting with in one month, and I think it's something like 87 people, and I can count now you guys among those. So I want to let you know that I am very much engaged in this community. I want to engage with you, that with the community, with the stakeholders. I want to engage with the business improvement district, and I, our commitment at Visit Santa Cruz County is to elevate and to enhance and to celebrate everything we have in this county and to communicate it to everybody throughout the world that wants to experience outdoor adventure and everything that's great about California you can find in this county. And we intend to, uh, to educate everyone about what we have. And furthermore, one of my personal uh, things is to improve the quality of life for all of the residents here. I truly believe that even though I run a destination management organization for the county, my number one customer and the number one customer of my coworkers are the residents of this community. So what you'll find is everything we do will help to increase, will will be, will seek to uh, improve the quality of life for our residents and also give a new outlook to those who want to come visit our, our community. Uh, so with that, I want to work with the chamber to educate and promote people about Capitola and the area, celebrate the wonderful assets of Capitola that we have that bring people to our community. I'd like to provide you guys with regular updates as, uh, as often as you need. And again, engage with the community, with the stakeholders, and with the Capitola Vill Village uh, and Wharf uh, Business Improvement District. So before I leave, I know I've only got a couple of minutes, but I did want to show you some of our most recent content. Uh, this, is, this particular one is a stroll through Capitola Village. As you can see, the uh, engagement there is, is, pretty, is pretty hellacious. Uh, this ad was shared in, two, in an A and B version and received over 4,000 
a link clicks, 3,000 likes, 302 comments, and reached over 183,000 accounts. And look at those pictures, and I'll talk about our photography in just a bit. Uh, here's another one, a uh, Facebook ad and post for the Capitola Art and Wine Festival. Uh, most of my staff went. I was not able because I was out of town, but it sounds like a fantastic event. Uh, but we shared this week an event prior so people would be aware of it and could attend. And if you can see there, over almost uh, uh, over 2,700 link clicks, which sparked 76 comments and 261 shares, and that's major. Uh, Facebook ad and post again, 200, uh, 2023 free summer concert movies, and the Twilight concerts uh, led the way uh, for this particular post. Uh, wharf love, we love our wharf. In fact, I was um, happy to be at the groundbreaking, and it's the first time I've ever seen a groundbreaking that didn't have shovels, it had golden crowbars. That was amazing. Um, I wish I'd gotten there earlier, because maybe I would have, got, would have gotten a golden crowbar, but... Um, uh, City Manager Goldstein, I'll, I'll, I'll hit him up for one later on. Uh, but these are some, again, some amazing photographs. I wanted to show you the one on the right there. We do scenic photos and we do information. It's not just about getting people into town. It's also letting them know if there is, if there are limitations or in, in some ways uh, uh, things they may need to be aware of in order to get around and to, and to get around the county freely and, and as easily as possible. Another one, another Facebook ad and social post with Capitola as the hero image, and you'll see uh, these photos quite, quite often. Uh, this one was Dine Al Fresco with the top patios in Santa Cruz County, and the other one was another Capitola Village hero shot, uh, which we often use uh, because it's such an iconic photo of our county. And we also do a blog. Our Visit Santa Cruz County blog is a great source of information for our visitors and for our residents as well. And some of the blog stories that, that we've done include dining with world-class views, again, the summer movies and concerts, dine al fresco, and a stroll through Capitol Village. Other notable uh, uh, Capitola features, we also did the classic car show, and we featured, again, the Art and Wine Festival. I did want to bring up uh, two of our photographers. Ben Ingram is one of them. Uh, he's always taking photographs for us. His eye is amazing. I, I say that because I have a master's degree in photography, which means nothing except that I can say that somebody has a great eye and, and actually mean it. Uh, this particular photo, um, I can't see the numbers right here, but they're stellar, and I didn't put them up there for you guys. But we have been down here in this area all the time taking photos, either on the ground or in the air with this drone. And here's another one. This one was by Liz Birnbaum. So Liz and Ben are our two uh, photographers we have on retainer. I also want to let you know that all of my staff members do contribute photography, especially Jen Day, who is phenomenal at, at some of her photographs. I particularly like this one uh, simply because of the, uh, the seal. So I just want to let you guys know that how happy I am to be here, how much I care about each and every community in this county, as well as the, uh, the census-designated areas and the county itself. I do live in Santa Cruz County. I did purchase a condo there, but I'm here to tell you that Santa Cruz means no more to me than this town, than no more to me than Scotts Valley, no more to me than Watsonville. Uh, this county is one of the most amazing destinations for anyone that wants to experience the wonder and the fun and the adventure of California. We have so much to offer, and it is my absolute pleasure to bring that to people throughout the world. With the results we, we will be bringing you, will be all of them will be experiential. We will innovate. Everything we do will be equitable, meaning that it will be easily divided among the communities, among the county, among our businesses. Everything we attempt will be achievable, or there's no point in achieving it, uh, attempting it. And because we, uh, our business is to bring business to the community, everything we do will have a component that faces revenue. So that's it. I just wanted to come and introduce myself. If you guys ever need anything from me, anytime, I'm at your beck and call. I believe in Capitola, I believe in Santa Cruz County, and I believe uh, in you guys doing the best job you can to, to make this community the best it can. I've had wonderful conversations uh, with city, city Manager Goldstein, and I know that everything you guys do is for the benefit of your community and for the benefit of our county. So thank you uh, very much for having me. Thank you so much for representing us and our wonderful city. Okay, we do have one more presentation this evening. It is um, on one of our grant reports from the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Thank you. Okay, I tap.
Is it on? No, you're good. Yeah. Okay. Good. <laughs> um, all right. Um, good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Thank you so much for having me here tonight. Um, I am representing NAMI, Santa Cruz County, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, uh, Santa Cruz County, and I am the Development Director for NAMI. I wanted to start tonight by talking a little bit about why we're here and why we've partnered on this important work which is that uh, even before the pandemic, mental health conditions were on the rise. Uh, one in five adults currently lives with a mental health condition every year, and that number is one in six for youth. Um, and tragically, suicide has now become the leading, second leading, excuse me, cause of death for young people. Um, you can see on the slide 10 to 34. So, you know, we went into this phase of COVID and things were already trending in the wrong direction and, and things got a little more difficult. As you can see, isolation, fear, grief, loss, skyrocketed anxiety, depression, and many people that were already struggling had a much more difficult time. Um, what we're seeing is that the rates for youth seem to be a little closer to one in four now. Young people are struggling with a mental health condition. And uh, recently the CDC released this data that 57% of teen girls and 70% 70, 70 for our queer youth are struggling and reporting uh, prolonged periods of sadness, depression, and hopelessness. And that's, that's, a, that's the current state of things. And we uh, believe that the numbers locally are, are in line you know, with the national trends. So that's kind of our why. And I wanted to talk a little bit about what your important partnership with NAMI is helping to do for families in this community. So NAMI has a, a very unique uh, function in our community in that we, we don't provide therapy or counseling directly or, or psychiatric services. What we do is we create a web of support for families. Um, and this looks like education, um, educating youth and adults about mental illness, uh, signs and symptoms, um, and what to do. Like, what to do if you think something's wrong? You know, where do you go? Who do you talk to um, when you think that something could be wrong? A lot, of, uh, a lot of parents don't know what is teen angst and what is signs of something more serious. So we really help to bridge that information gap. Uh, we work to reduce stigma in the community, and this looks like tabling. This looks like community presentations um, so that people feel comfortable asking for help when they need it. We connect people to resources. We have a helpline in English and one in Spanish. And um, these helplines are staffed by um, very highly trained uh, NAMI volunteers and staff members. And they connect people to resources. People call looking for help. Like I said, maybe they don't know where to go for support. Um, and they, they reach a compassionate person on the other line who is a peer, meaning they have been through this either themselves or supporting a family member. So we connect people to resources. And the last thing that we do is we support people. We support individuals and families. Um, our compassionate support groups uh, provide a, a really unique and safe space for people to come and um, you know, maybe in between therapy sessions, maybe you uh, you don't get more than one session a month with your insurance or don't have insurance at all. So these uh, these support groups are a really special um, and unique place to find compassionate support from your peers. So last fiscal year, countywide, NAMI served 13,000 plus. It's actually closer to 13.5 and uh, that was through a variety of programs, our presentations for schools, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a minute. Uh, for law enforcement, we partnered with the sheriffs to uh, provide a CIT crisis intervention training uh, and presentations for the community at large, which happen right now on Zoom. So they're very accessible for um, all the different communities within the county. Um, and I mentioned the support groups that we have. Uh, we have support groups for parents, support groups for 
peers, meaning people with a mental health condition, and support groups also for uh, people supporting an adult loved one with a mental health condition. We also have classes, and um, we, uh, let's see, I've got to look at my notes here. We had uh, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine classes which were in our grant, um, and these were classes in English and Spanish for parents uh, and for family members. And these are six weeks, six week courses. So each class is a six week session, um, and they're uh, they're very in depth, and they have a lot of wonderful material. We also have classes for providers mental health providers and other people that uh, serve youth mostly, but also just serve um, mental health needs in our community. So countywide, we served last fiscal year 6,177 family members, um, somebody supporting a family member uh, over 18 with a mental health condition. And 5,796 youth, parents, school staff, that's teachers and administrative staff, uh, and youth supporting adults at other organizations such as um, PVPSA or Encompass, um, places like that, uh, Boys and Girls Club. I wanted to talk a little bit about ending the silence. This is our, uh, our presentation program for youth in schools. And this is one thing that your partnership funded. And uh, I have a little bit of information about the impact that that had, just so you can see a slice of what your support did for teens at SoCal High. So 300 teens at SoCal High participated in this uh, presentation. And it's a conversation, it's a, it's a presentation about mental health, mental illness, signs and symptoms, like I said, where, uh, when to seek help and, and where to turn for that help. And it really reduces stigma and normalizes conversations about mental illness for uh, youth. Um, and also 78, more than 78 students also um, participated in uh, a mental health, uh, school-wide mental health event um, at our booth, um, participated in learning about resources, learning about mental health. Um, oh, can you go back? One thing I wanted to show is that as a result of ending the silence this presentation, we poll our students, we, we survey them, and we, we want to get a feeling for whether the material is hitting home. Um, and as a result of the presentation, 89% of these students say they feel more knowledgeable about the signs of mental health conditions, and 87% of them understand, because of the presentation, how to seek help. That's pretty powerful. Um, this is a slide showing our helplines. I like to end with this because um, these are the gateway to NAMI services. Um, and this is, really, uh, this is really what I would like everyone to remember after this, is that this is the, really the gateway to getting help. No matter what you're struggling with, what, you're, what, you're, um, what your family may be dealing with, if you have mental health concerns and you're not sure where to go next, call these lines. Okay, and I wanted to end with this quote from a mother who participates in our support group for parents of youth. She says, I have never felt so heard and understood in this journey of parenting a child who struggles so greatly with mental illness. It feels incredibly supportive and safe. And thank you, and if you have any questions for me, I'd be happy to take those. Thank you. Great presentation. Any questions? I just want to say thank you for the work that you're doing. And I was noticing too, just on um, just looking at the helplines, the fact that it's an 831 number, I, like not seeing like some call toll free, like it's an actual landline of a local place to help, I think just kind of speaks volumes to how involved you are here, you know? And so um, thank you. And I'm glad that the grants have helped you guys out. We're so grateful for your support, and it really is making a difference in the community. So thank you. Thank you. OK, that's it for presentations this evening. Um, report on closed session. No closed session. Thank you. Any additional materials? 
Staff included the presentations from tonight's meeting in the agenda packet, but no additional materials were distributed. Great, thank you. Okay, we'll move to item six, which is oral communications by members of the public. Um, these are on any consent items or anything not on tonight's agenda. Um, you will be limited to three minutes. Is there anybody in-house that wishes to speak? Hi, my name is Goran Klapic. I live here in the county, uh, not too far away from here. Uh, I have something on my mind uh, that uh, I think somebody is living by 41st Avenue by the McDonald's area on CVS Pharmacy. There is always garbage being dumped. And I wrote to the director of public works already that it's not the responsibility of the taxpayers to uh, clean this mess up. It should be uh, uh, the two companies taking care of that, that the garbage is being removed. Something else that is on my mind is there are always gang signs or graffiti signs in the Jade Street Park uh, where I uh, shoot baskets, play basketball, and where also little children play. And I don't think it's really safe to, uh, to be allowing that. Um, uh, and I also want to remind something that happened in 2020. I lost a dear friend. His name was Damon Gusviller. Um, he was a officer. He lost his life on duty. I knew him personally. I uh, met him four times when he had to respond to some uh, calls uh, at Willowbrook Park uh, for some things that happened. Thank you very much uh, for listening. Have a great day. God bless you all. Thank you. First of all, I want to thank the mayor and the council for, is that better? Yeah. <laughs> for uh, the proclamation and acknowledgement of my husband. George and I both love Capitola. And um, I wanted to say that I've been watching the wharf restoration. I'm very excited about it. Um, and um, I've been uh, in touch with the committee about all of the wonderful changes that we're going to be seeing. Um, and I, my mental image was I wanted to donate a bench in George's honor to the wharf and when it's rebuilt. But then I was told that actually, uh, with all the wonderful things that are being done, that the benches are up to the city council and that the city council, as I heard, uh, had so many applications that they sort of stopped taking applications after a time. And that uh, at this time, that I might ask for it to be put on an agenda to um, reconsider, if that's possible. It, I loved the fact that in, in the city, in our pink bricks, people put their names on the bricks and there were acknowledgments and people just love that. And the idea of having benches, new benches, on our beautiful new wharf in 2024, it seemed like a wonderful thing. And so I just wanted to ask for it to be added to the agenda to consider something like that, opening it up, whether it has to be brought up with the public or however it's done. So that's all. But anyway, thank you very much for this. I very appreciate it. Thank you. Hi, good evening, uh, Mayor Kaiser and Council and City Manager Goldstein and staff. My name is Leslie Nielsen. I've been a resident of Capitola on and off for my whole life. And I just want to thank you tonight for your grant to the NAMI organization. Um, they came into my life five years ago when a very unexpected turn of events happened with my family. I'd never heard of them before. And without NAMI, I wouldn't be where I am today. And it's just a beautiful organization. Um, after I took one of their classes, I got certified to teach for them, and I've been teaching some of the classes that Danu talked about today for five years. And I really just want to thank you for your advocacy, your funding, your partnership, the impact we've had on these kids. And I'm the lead presenter for the Ending the Silence program is remarkable. And 
Um, I see it on the front line every day. I was just um, talking to fifth and sixth graders in Watsonville yesterday, and I'll be doing the Soquel High School shtick again with the, um, the, um, with the freshmen in November. So thank you very much for prioritizing something so important to our community. It really is making a difference. Great to hear it. Thanks for your work as well. Any other people in house? Seeing none, do we have anybody on Zoom? There are no hands raised on Zoom, Mayor. Great, thank you. Okay, we'll take it back to uh, any staff comments. I did have just a quick comment. I wanna let the community know that starting next week, we're gonna start driving piles. So you will start to hear the noise. <laughs> I think everyone should be ready for that. The Public Works Director is working with the contractor to try to work on a bit of a schedule around the noise. So that maybe we'll end up having certain days when we're doing pile driving and other days when we're not to give people a little bit of a break. But we haven't finalized those details yet, but I just want everyone to be ready for next week. It's going to be it's going to be a lot of work going on. Thank you. Uh, any council comments? Yes. Thank you. Um, okay, so I have a couple comments this evening. Um, first, I wanted to speak to the mayor's proclamation for George. George was a friend and a neighbor. Uh, my husband and I moved into Capitola Village about six years ago, and George was always very kind and thoughtful and warm, and he would drop off, he would finish reading his Sports Illustrated magazines and then drop them off at the door for, for my husband or the uh, sports section of the paper. Uh, he was always smiling. He was just immensely thoughtful and kind, and he was incredibly beloved by me and Julie and Justin and the rest of the neighbors in the building, um, and just truly beloved by all who knew him, and he will be dearly missed. Um, I wanted to share with the community generally as the vice chair of Metro, the transit district, that we had a historic purchase uh, agreement that we signed last week for 57 hydrogen fuel cell zero emission buses. It is the largest uh, hydrogen bus fleet in the nation, or it will be once they, they come in. We just signed the contract for it. So that's really exciting. And of course, um, with considerations of, of what's gonna happen at our Capitola Mall and us having a transit station there now, I think it's gonna be really exciting in the future to see these zero emission uh, hydrogen fuel cell buses coming into Capitola and taking people where they need to go uh, without any tailpipes or greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and then two questions for staff. Uh, the first is I'd like to make a request for a future agenda item uh, for the council to consider a resolution declaring tobacco waste as a public and environmental health hazard. And then also uh, if we could speak to the question that was brought up at public comment about um, the, the bench plaques and if we are if we have a process for accepting that, if we're not accepting that, if there's a vacancy, um, how, how, what's going on there? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Council Member Brown. So the benches are one of the most popular forms of memorial that the city has, and currently all the benches are full. So we do get routine requests from people who are always asking about getting benches. The benches on the wharf are full up. You'll recall that we made the decision to put the plaques back um, where they were before the storm. So we're not gonna have any vacancies right now on the wharf, but we do have a process by which people can be informed. And then if we do get a vacancy, we can let folks know and we figure out a process. I think it's a lottery or something to select who would get the next opportunity at a bench. Um, I will let the community know that the CWEP project is accepting fundraising donations. And on in the fundraising donations, there's the opportunity to have donor acknowledgement on a donor wall. Uh, as well as there are opportunities for memorial benches on the Cliff Drive railing. I think those are still still available. So there are some opportunities there available. Unfortunately, at this point, the benches, which are one of the most popular items, um, are full up. Thank you. I'd like to do a shout-out or a couple of shout-outs. Uh, last night, there was a great event by CWIP. I just thought we should uh, shout-out to Britannia Arms for Sydney and Andy for a job great done. And uh, Jerry Jensen, I, I heard we raised over $23,000. So that's, that'll go good. Good project. Thanks, everybody. 
Yes, I will jump uh, off of that as well. This weekend um, was pretty full for us for Capitola, starting Friday with the groundbreaking of the wharf um, and having Jimmy Panetta come and having all of council there and staff was just uh, really fulfilling. And I think it's uh, kind of lightening the mood in Capitola after all that we've been through this winter. Um, also, yes, uh, Thank you, CWIP and the Britannia Arms. Uh, last night was the final fundraiser um, between a raffle that went on from CWIP and then dinners that were donated and then 50% of the proceeds that were made at Britannia Arms throughout the entire day yesterday. Um, we were able to get Yes, $23,275. So that is epic. And that's all going to the wharf project. So can't wait to see what we can do with all that. So thank you, Jerry and CWIP and the Brit. All right, any other comments or anything? Okay, we can go move on to consent. All items listed as consent items will be enacted in one motion in the form listed below unless anybody wants to pull an item. I'll move approval of consent. I'll second. Great, we have a first and a second. May we have a roll call, please? Councilmember Brooks? Aye. Councilmember Clark? Aye. Councilmember Peterson? Aye. Vice Mayor Brown? Aye. And Mayor Kaiser? Aye. Great, passes unanimously. We will move on to item nine, which is our general government. We have item 9A. This is the universally accessible playground at Jade Street Park naming. The recommended action is to select a playground name for this UA playground. And here's Chloe. Thank you, Mayor and Council. This is kind of a fun item that you may have been expecting. Um, as you know, back in June, I'll let our um, clerk remind me exactly, perfect. So in June, you reviewed the conceptual playground design for a universally accessible playground at Jade Street Park. You'll notice I'm stumbling a little bit because that's not a super fun name for a playground. So that's why we're here. Uh, you also approved an, uh, the idea and an official partnership with the Friends of Santa Cruz County Parks. Uh, they will be running and are currently running a fundraising campaign to raise money towards the playground. So we're very appreciative of that. At that time, you also did kind of review and approve the, their idea, which was to kind of crowdsource for that playground name by um, asking for community submissions. And then um, there would be a friends run committee selecting the top three, bringing those here for you to choose from this evening. And then in, later in July, you approved the final conceptual design and an administrative policy which outlined um, sponsorship opportunities at the playground. So that brings us, here are some images just to kind of remind you. Uh, part of that conceptual design is a marine ocean shoreline theme that'll come into play here in a minute. And again, it is really designed to be universally accessible so all children can play together. So between June 9th and August 30th, the community submitted 70 name ideas to the friends. So people are excited about this project and so am I. Uh, there was a six person committee led by the friends that did review all name submissions. All 70 were reviewed using this criteria. So there were kind of three different pieces that were important that the name um, fit into. So markability, distinction, is the name easy to say? Is this something that the friends are going to be able to use to raise money for the playground? So that was the first criteria. Secondly, uh, is this name significant to Capitola, to our community, to the history of our community? Does it resonate with Capitola? And third, uh, is there any kind of alignment with that ocean theme? Those three um, criteria were determined. So with that being said, after much thought, Unanimously, the committee came to these top three choices. And keep in mind, these will all fit before, you know, at Jade Street Park. So it's a longer name. So we want, we want you to think about that. So the top three here, Jewel Box Playground at Jade Street Park, Lighthouse Landing at Jade Street Park, or Treasure Cove at Jade Street Park. And really, we don't even need to see the recommendation slide because it's just to pick one. And you might want to see them as you talk. So I can answer any questions. Thank you so much.
Thanks, Chloe. Do we have any questions? <laughs> I have a brief question. Sure. What if a major donor came and wanted a certain name for that? Could we still be open um, for that? Yes. So, for example, if I were to donate $2 million, it would be Chloe's Park. Treasure Cove at Jade Street Park. <laughs> that would be fine. So you can still pick one. that we would take combos. it. Yes, I know. I wish I could. Uh, okay. Oh, uh, public, public comment. Hi, sorry. Uh, any public comment on this item? Seeing none, is there anybody online? There are no hands raised, Mayor. Okay. We can come back to council if anybody wants to throw out an option or what we're thinking. What's, what rolls off the tongue? I like the first one. The double J's? I like Treasure Cove. Like Treasure Cove. Okay. Yeah. The battle of the ends here. Any other thoughts? <laughs> we can so weird. I know. You know, I could give some I can give some insight. You know, the there was like Chloe said, there was a committee. They they really went through this and um, some of the committee members had had, you know, previously when they worked on Leo's Haven had really tried to build consensus around um, naming this park. And so they use some of the same tools. Um, so I really resonate with Treasure Cove because of the, the jeweled streets in the area. And when I think about that, that park um, being surrounded by Jewel Street and Emerald Street and or what I was going to say, Garnett mm -hmm. Street and all of those, I think about a treasure box. Um, and that's really what that project makes me think of. It's such a treasure to Capitola. Um, and then I believe Cove bounces off of the mobile home park next door, right? Doesn't it have a Cove name? There was some sort of Cove. There was a reason behind it. That may be true. I think the idea with Cove is also just kind of an ocean oh. sea. Well, I made that up in my brain. <laughs> um, oh, it's trade winds. Okay. Um, so anyways, I like Treasure Cove for that reason um, and for those listening with the $2 million. Um, it could be your name and Treasure Cove at Jade Street Park. And I also like that we're keeping at Jade Street Park. I know that was really important to the community mm -hmm. um, that we're all forever going to know that as Jade Street. Um, but to have a name, I think of like a treasure box, you know, emblem or something like that. Anyways, that's those are my thoughts. Sorry, Joe. I like Treasure Cove. Too. Oh, yeah. Um, I was kind of with Joe on this, but I I'm into the Treasure Cove too. I think it's How about Jewel Box Treasures <laughs> <laughs> at Jane Street Park. That gets to be a lot. Oh, I don't know. Anybody else have any other ones they want to throw out? I would just add that the group. Met, right? We had a committee. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, Chloe's like, yes. we've met, don't do this test, um, several times. So I'd make a motion to adopt Treasure Cove at Jade Street Park. Um, I'll second. Great. A motion and a second. Maybe we have a roll call, please. Councilmember Brooks? Aye. Councilmember Clark? Aye. Councilmember <laughs> Peterson. Reluctant. But Aye. <laughs> Vice Mayor Brown. Aye. And Mayor Kaiser. Aye. Thank you. That passes unanimously as well. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chloe. Good work. Now we got to come up with a logo, huh? All right. Oh, good. Okay. Oh, good. <laughs> I don't want to vote on logos no, now. <laughs> I'll show you that one. All right. We're at 9B. This is the Bay Avenue and Hill Street Traffic Safety. Director Khan is here for us. So apologies, this is going to be way, way less fun. <laughs> Very important. Yes. Um, so staff had originally, um, this item, Bay, the Bay Hill uh, intersection, was one of the council goals to address in the fiscal year 23-24 budget. There was $50,000 allocated to it. Um, staff had started preparing this report um, for presentation later in the fiscal year, but um, there has recently been a few collisions, including a pedestrian collision with injuries in this intersection, so we are bringing this forward this evening. Um, so this is the intersection in question. This is uh, Bay, which is running up and down your screen, and then uh, Hill, and then the intersection with the um, 
Knob Hill Shopping Center. This is a minor arterial street that intersects with a residential street and then the shopping center. The average daily traffic on this the, on the Bay Street or Bay Avenue is about 10,000 uh, cars per day. And there's nine approaches to this intersection. So three on each side of Bay, two coming from the shopping center and one coming from Hill Street. Next slide, please. Um, so we collected accident data from November 2017 through August of 2023. There were multiple, mostly two vehicle collisions in this intersection. However, there were three pedestrian um, collisions, all with injuries, uh, one in 2017, one in 2022, and one most recently in August of 2023. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this is just to give you kind of a frame of reference of pedestrian accidents with vehicles citywide. So this is a heat map. Um, this has data all the way back to 2012. There was approximately 38 pedestrian crashes since that time from 2012 to 2023. Um, three in the Bay Hill intersection. So obviously most of the pedestrian collisions uh, happened there or down kind of in the village. But this is another hotspot for us in the city. Uh, next slide, please. So the evaluation criteria we did for our options for this intersection consisted of level of service. Level of service is a, quantity, a qualitative term that goes from level A to F, A being the best, F being the worst. Um, and it's based on roadway factors such as speed, travel time, delay, and safety. So it's not just a one criteria um, way of uh, evaluating an intersection. Currently, this intersection is at level of service C, so right there in the middle. Um, the acceptable level of service per our general plan in this intersection is level of service D. Uh, the second evaluation criteria is queue length. So that's the space needed to stack waiting cars, both in travel and three lanes. So basically how far you're going to be backed up in the intersection and how that affects the traffic behind in intersections behind you. And then the third criteria was bicycle and pedestrian safety, which is most impacted by visibility, how vehicles see vehicle, uh, pedestrians and bicyclists in crosswalks, and then also crossing distance, the length that it takes you to get across the street and how long you are exposed to traffic. Next slide, please. Uh, so we came up with four alternatives, one being always stop control, which is the current uh, situation in the intersection, signal control, which I think is self-explanatory, a roundabout, and then a road diet. So I'm going to go over each one of those and the pros and cons of each scenario. Uh, next slide, please. So a signal control, I think, is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, signal control in this intersection, most appropriate would be overhead signals. Those are considered the safest type of signals, and especially considering this is already an always stop-controlled intersection, putting just the side signals on there wouldn't really be recommended. Um, this provides a um, for drivers certainty and when they're supposed to go and when they're supposed to stop and also um, for pedestrian and bicycles when the time is to go and stop. So it decreases the level of uncertainty in drivers in this intersection. Next slide. So like I said, the pros would be reducing driver uncertainty, providing designated crossing times. The cons would be a high capital and maintenance cost. A uh, new intersection signal fully signalized is about $450,000 and takes about $5,000 a year to maintain. Um, typically, when you go to something that's signalized, it is really it gets you to an increased accident rate because people are trying to beat the lights, people are trying to merge quickly. Um, so often it ends up having more collisions than less. Um, they are not pretty, so aesthetics is definitely a con for this one. And then also increased idle time. So in the um, staff report, the level of service is improved, um, but that, like I said, level of service has many considerations. It has safety, it has idle time, it has delay maneuverability. So while you would get more cars, for example, going at once through, through Bay, you would be waiting a long time on Hill. So you have increased idle time, you'd be sitting there longer waiting for all the Bay traffic to go through, which is also not great for our greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the second consideration was a roundabout. So a roundabout would uh, constrict all of the lanes. Instead of having three approaches, you would have one from each uh, uh, end of the intersection. It would also um, include medians there. So the crossing distance would be shortened overall, but also broken into two. So pedestrians would only be crossing one direction of traffic at a time. Uh, next slide, please. So just in case you're not familiar with a roundabout, it goes in a counterclockwise fashion. You have one entry point that have all yields. Um, the rate of the curvature makes it so 
cars can really only go about 25 miles an hour, um, so it definitely slows traffic flow as compared to a signalized intersection. Um, it also, they're often designed, as would be designed in this intersection, with kind of a truck apron. So it gives the ability for larger vehicles, such as giving deliveries to a shopping center or a fire truck, the ability to kind of roll over the center island so it wouldn't slow down response times and also allow for maneuverability. Next slide, please. One major consideration with a roundabout is it really reduces conflict points. So for example, a conflict point is really anywhere where there can be a collision, either vehicle to vehicle or vehicle to pedestrian or bicycle. So in this example, car one and car two have this collision point where both of them are trying to go through the intersection. Next slide, please. Um, if you extrapolate that to all of the turn mechanisms, there's about 40 different spots to have a crash in this intersection. And this actually is missing a lane on the uh, bay side because there's three lanes across. So there's 40 plus places for two vehicles to collide. There's also 26 pedestrian conflicts, which aren't shown on this slide because then it just gets really messy. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in contrast, a roundabout greatly reduces conflict points. So on the schematic, the vehicle conflict points are in red. They're within the circle and then merging to get in the circle. And then the pedestrian conflict points are in those two points where you would be exposed to traffic. So it reduces them from 40 vehicle and 26 pedestrian to eight of each from a four-way stop to a roundabout in this intersection. So the pros, as I said, would be the reduction in conflict points, the shortened crossing distances for pedestrians. It would uh, be the most improved level of service of all of our options here and reduce greenhouse gas emissions because idling would be really minimized. The cons are obviously a high initial capital cost, about $450,000 for this initially as well. And then driver uncertainty, because there aren't a whole lot of roundabouts in our community, there would need to be quite a bit of uh, education and outreach and definitely would be uncertainty in the initial rollout of this concept. Next slide, please. So our last consideration for the evening is a road diet. So it might be kind of hard to make out here, but basically we're reducing the lanes from um, three lanes on Bay Hill to two. And so it's condensing the um, right through lane into one right through lane. So, and then also providing um, bulb outs so it reduces the crossing distance. Uh, next slide, please. So the way, there's several ways to put out something like a road diet. One option is called a quick build. So in this slide here, we have a current situation, a quick build situation, which is where you use lower cost materials um, such as paint and ballers and planters to uh, delineate where cars should be. It's nice because it can be rolled out quickly and it can also be used as a trial run and it's also very adjustable. Um, and then you could go to the permanent solution with your curb extensions and your raised intersection, which has a higher capital cost, approximately $200,000 in this instance, um, after you evaluate the effectiveness of your interim quick build. Next slide, please. Um, benefits of the road diet, uh, the, the bulb outs uh, really slow turning, uh, turning speeds. You have a, a sharper turn there, so it slows you down. And it also gives a, like I said before, a shorter crossing distance for pedestrians. Next slide. It also really helps visibility of pedestrians. So there's a raised walkway, the, you see the concrete because it's bulbed out. Um, and then next slide. So we have our pros and cons here. So it would improve our driver certainty because there are less lanes, less um, maneuvers to consider when it's your turn in the intersection, reduce vehicle speeds, increase pedestrian visibility, short and crossing distance. The cons here, and really the major con with this one, is a decreased level of service. And honestly, it would bring it down to a decreased level of service lower than what is in our general plan for this particular intersection. Um, so that would be the real difference to residents is that it would take you much longer to get through this intersection and then also have increased queuing. So it would back up significantly more toward in both directions on Bay Avenue. Next slide. Um, so this is a summary. Um, it's a truncated table of what was in the staff report, but the ones that were the most significant, uh, green being improved, red being um, not improved are made a worse situation for each of these categories. Um, just visually, you can see that roundabout has the most uh, improved measures, while the signal has the most reduced measures. 
um, though in consideration of wanting to do something quickly to address the immediate issues, staff is recommending, as in the staff report, the uh, quick build road diet. Next slide, please. So just for a little bit of a visual of a road diet, there's a few different ways to do a quick build. So this one is very simple, just one color paint, some bollards, couple planters. Next slide, please. There's also communities that get a little more artsy with it, for lack of a better word. Um, these are temporary installations, so that's one thing to consider. And it's also considering that, you know, people have been very used to this intersection for a long time, and these type of bold prints really uh, show that there's something different going on in this intersection. Next slide, please. So the staff recommendation for this in the short term is that we would go and talk to all of the um, adjacent property owners, most of which are commercial in this, or all of which are commercial in this intersection, and complete public outreach on the road diet quick build, and then evaluate the quick build from spring of 2024 to spring of 2026. Two years, two full seasons is a really good amount of time to evaluate if this is something that one works and then two that the public will accept. Uh, long term, the uh, long term solution, probably the, the best level of service and considering some of those other factors in previous slides would be a roundabout. Um, we recognize that that might be something we can't roll out right away. Um, it, like I said, public education outreach would be a really important factor in putting a roundabout anywhere in the city. Um, we would pursue uh, funding. Um, these are really attractive projects for the Air Board, for the RTC, and their competitive grants. So that's something that staff could do in the background. And then summer 2026 would be a good, good time frame to aim to construct a roundabout if council directs staff to do so. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Great, thank you. Do you have any questions? question about our roundabout it's going to be built how, how far are we out on that just down the street so that is with pg e so we have an undergrounding district the rule 28 program is coming to an end and they are trying to spend that money relatively quickly so we are, are in conversations with all the utilities that need to be undergrounded for that so that best case scenario would be through pg and &E. I would say the next first quarter of next year and then if everything went to plan and the council wanted to fund the roundabout in that area, we could have it constructed next summer. I do like the idea of the roundabout. However, I, I'm concerned about the elderly that live in the area that cross there every day. It might be a little, you know, a little more uh, confusing for them or some of the other things. And it, it might be a good idea to do the, the, the other um, project so that when we do get a roundabout, we can see how well it works and then if we need to change further then we, we can go ahead and do that so I like that um, I'm curious why I'm think, trying to get their name the folks that did the study didn't look at something that was less um, excessive like a blinky stop sign with a smaller light beacon light beacon why did they go to such extreme so typically you only want one thing controlling the intersection. So what's controlling the intersection right now is the stop sign. When you put up something like a push activated blinky light, that gives, oh, sorry, go on. Yeah, no, not that, but some oh. stop signs just blink with, um, by solar hmm. and or have, you know, they're run by solar. So they just are more visible to, to folks to stop. Oh, sorry, so just the stop sign, not at, so that is something that we could do. I will say a lot of the um, confusion in that intersection is from all of the lanes coming in that people don't know when to go. Also, people trying to beat each other in that merge as you're heading down this way on Bay Avenue. So while that would definitely help with the visibility of the stop sign, and that definitely is part of the problem, people just not stopping, period, that wouldn't address all of the safety issues. Yeah, I, and so I guess my, the larger question is when you went to Kimberly Horn for the study, we were looking at alleviating the, uh, the the collisions, not really focusing on bike and pedestrian safety. I know I saw like a bike ramp and some other things, but to your point earlier, there would have to be a lot of community training and, you know, to really deal with that. And um, I, I thought that when council gave, um, gave direction to look at this, we were, it was due to the pedestrian bike safety issues, not so many, much as 
the clinicians. Do you know if Kim, Kimberly Horn addressed anything like that? I saw the ramp and do they, can you elaborate on some of those? Sure, so both the road diet and the roundabout do address mostly pedestrian collisions. So it either reduces the crossing distance or only makes the pedestrian cross one direction of traffic flow at a time. So both of those are what are called proven countermeasures with the MUTCD, which they put a percentage of how much this affects people and how, how increased or decreased the collisions are. And so both of those are proven countermeasures for pedestrian traffic. Um, for bicycle traffic, I would say they're not as effective. And then to Councilmember Clark's point, when looking at the entire lane, we know that we have a one, it's less lanes over by down bay. So when Kimberly Horn looked at this, did they just look at this intersection or did they assess the entire Bay Avenue traffic impact um, with and without the potent possible roundabout down by Gales? So it did not include a roundabout down by Gales. So it did not consider that. It did consider, though, the current way that this whole uh, corridor works and the um, the change of number of lanes as you go up and down it. So we would be reducing lanes. Well, it's already a one lane down by Gales already, and this would essentially continue to be a one lane should we move with the roundabout. So we're losing lanes essentially on Bay Avenue. In both situations. So in the roundabout and in the road diet, we'd be losing lanes, correct? Okay, those are all my questions. Thank you. Questions? Can I see the slide with the road diet again? And then while we're pulling that up, if I'm understanding correctly, the roundabout, there would be no more stop signs in that intersection, right? So people coming out of the parking lot from Knob Hill and CVS, you would just yield, but you would just keep going. No one would be stopping anymore. Yeah, hopefully. Correct. Okay. Um, uh, okay, I see. So uh, there Further back, Julia. Uh, uh, yep, there you go. So, oh, okay. So the lane that we're losing is that there's no longer two lanes going straight through the intersection. It becomes one lane going straight through the intersection, and then there's no more merge lane once you get through. Correct? Correct. The merge would be further back. Okay, so then where's the, so then that one lane, once you get through the intersection, you can either go straight or turn into the Riverview neighborhood, because right now there are two lanes there, and one turns into Riverview neighborhood and one goes straight. So the straight right turn lane on both approaches would be a combined straight right lane. And, and, and once you get through the intersection, that essentially is the same thing? That's just one, do you, do you know what I'm saying? Once you get through the intersection, there's like a little median that divides that street for the people that are turning behind Knob Hill into the River Riverview neighborhood. So yes, that would be one lane all the way through. Going back towards the freeway it would go back to two. So, no, not back no. towards the freeway. You know what I'm talking about, Jamie? Yeah. So I think, correct me if I'm wrong. So we're talking about we were talking about that basically staying the way it is today as a bus turnout because there's a bus stop right there, and then we wouldn't touch the right turn into center. Oh, I'm sorry. We're talking about further down the street. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's not on this. It's not. Sorry, I should have explained. It's not on the screen what I'm actually talking about. It's like a right off right off the edge over here. Yeah, um, so effectively there would be sort of two lanes for a portion there, but really it would be basically a bus turnout is what we would treat the initial portion. And now there's only one straightaway lane. There isn't two with that rush to try to merge on the other side. Um, okay, I think that's all my questions for now. It's still two two lanes off the freeway, right? Yes. And then from it merges into one right there where the uh, car wash is, correct? I just want to make sure I'm understanding. You just have to pick a side. Like either you're turning or going, turning left or going straight or going. But it looks like it becomes one lane over like where it says keep clear. It looks like it's two lanes before that, and then when it says keep clear, it turns into one lane, and then it splits again into two, and you're either going straight and right, or you're going left. Yep. Am I understanding that correctly? Because it looks like a little bulb out in the middle. Yeah. This is a conceptual design. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and so maybe to make it clear, we would be coming back. If council wants to proceed with this, we'd like to meet with the 
property owners who are adjacent okay. to this intersection and work on some of the details. I mean, I think there's still a question. Jessica and I have been debating about whether or not it's better to have a, a left turn there as you're heading south on Bay Avenue from the freeway towards the village. Right now, it's a left turn lane you can see there. Mm -hmm. Or if it would be better to have a right turn lane into the center and then a straight lane that's both straight and left. You can have a right turn only right at the yeah. car wash to alleviate that. Yeah, there's a couple of different options around there. And so I think focusing too much on the overall exact geometry of how we'd be narrowing down, I think we would want to have more input and then ultimately from the traffic engineers and then bring something back to the council. Okay. But I think one other detail that could be worth at least putting into the hopper to think a little bit about is when we get the roundabout done at Bay Cap Ave, if we do that project, I suspect that a lot of the issues that we see there will move to here. Because, you know, Jessica and I have spent a fair bit of time just sort of watching this intersection. And one of the things we've really noticed is that the traffic from in front of Gales is so metered by that intersection that only about like one car comes down Bay Avenue towards the freeway like every 10 seconds or six seconds. So the volume, I think, of traffic that's going to be able to move through the Gales intersection with a roundabout would be quicker, which is great for the delay there, but then it would hit here. And so we're just not sure whether or not in the long term the road diet actually would hold up uh, if we were to do the roundabout at Gales. So that's kind of thinking about the short term and the long term strategy in that context as well. Does that help? All right. Thank you. I have comments, but I'll save them for some public comment. Yeah. So the. Um Quick build road diet. That's what's being recommended by staff, right? As a temporary basis prior to the roundabout. Correct. And um, do we have a cost estimate on that? That would be about approximately fifty thousand dollars, which is budgeted in the current okay. Great. fiscal year. Thank you. Great. Uh, any public comment on this item? Uh, good evening, council members. I'm uh, Doug Lay, and I'm here representing Red Tree Partners, which is the owner of the Knob Hill Shopping Center and the uh, property next to the freeway. So the, we have, number one, I think it's great that you're considering making changes to this intersection. I get scared every time I get there myself uh, because there's all this confusion about who's going what direction and who got who got there first and who should go. So. I think it's terrific, and we appreciate your, your making that effort. Um, I think the conversation that you had amongst yourselves asking questions raised some very important issues. And, and our experience, my experience with traffic, is that you can't look at things in isolation. So for example, our property, there are three different entrances on that side of, the, of coming from the freeway up to the shopping center. Uh, there are streets on the other side, particularly crossroads. You started talking about what's going to happen up here by Gales. You need to look at all of this together. And I think going ahead with a short-term solution to make it safer is great. But I also think it's very important to look at the entire picture because what you do at that intersection is going to affect crossroads. It's going to affect the entrance into the senior center. It's going to affect what happens up here. What you do with if there is something that happens by Gales is going to affect that intersection at Hill. And the traffic engineers are great at this. They just have to take the time and really run the scenarios. And I would encourage you to take the time and involve the community in doing that. And we would and welcome participation in that process. Thanks a lot. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. But I probably won't have any answers. But. Thank you. Anybody else in house? Not seeing any. Is there anybody online? We have one speaker with their hand raised, Mayor. Uh, Janet Edwards, you've been allowed to speak. If you can unmute yourself, you'll have three minutes. Janet, once you start talking, we'll go ahead and start the timer. But we can't hear you at the moment.
Seems like there might be a technical difficulty because she um, has unmuted herself, but we're not hearing her. Okay. Maybe we could circle back in a couple of minutes. Yes. Or is there anybody else? Sorry. There's no other speakers with their hands raised. Um, yeah, Janet, if you want to try again. And then uh, we can go to any other questions from council or comments. Yes, because it sounds like Janet, it's not working, unfortunately. Um, so I'm a, I'm a little concerned with the roundabout at, at the place that it's being proposed right now. Um, the speed of the people coming off the freeway and down Bay is not the speed that the people will be at when they're coming out of a parking lot. And so while there is a kind of a yield, I feel like there's going to be still a difference in how fast people are coming around a roundabout when they're coming down Bay from the freeway and those who are coming out of a parking lot. I feel like you need more acceleration time to get up to the speed that the people are going around the, the um, roundabout on Bay. And this is based on my um, entirely non-technical skills as a traffic engineer. Um, but that's one of my concerns. Um, I, I also agree I, I think in front of Gales is a good place to have a roundabout, and I'm glad we're moving forward with that. But I agree that we need to look at this larger picture of what that roundabout means when we're looking from the Bay Avenue exit from the freeway all the way down to where it intersects with um, uh, Monterey. So uh, th those are my concerns with the roundabout. I'm, I'm okay with the quick build road diet. I like the idea of the colorful road paint. I would want to see... Um, some council members on some kind of committee or in meetings with the engineers to determine some of the parameters of the actual road diet, only because I, I'm concerned that there will be a report that comes back to us with some options like we just saw, and then if we're not happy with all three of them, the answer will essentially be, well, it's more money and more time if you want us to look at more options, whereas if we had council members in there to begin with, maybe some of the things that council members would consider would be part of the discussion. Um, and then again, this being kind of a temporary measure, I, I'm not fully prepared to say, let's move into phase, you know, let's approve phase two where we will go to this roundabout. I am prepared to say, let's do quick build road diet. Let's see how it turns out. In the meantime, I really think we should study the full length of Bay Avenue rather than moving straight into a roundabout that, that will phase into another roundabout. Thank you. Um, we're gonna jump over to Janet. Sounds like her volume's working. Thank you. I got it. Um, I am concerned about um, looking at just the, the other part, just the, the intersection, like the gentleman was saying, because I often come from the post office and can't get back towards the freeway because people are coming so fast. My other concern is um, temporary things for um, the crosswalks are difficult for people who are blind because they use more than just painted streets, they use parts of the curb and bulb outs, bulb outs are difficult because they also use the sound of the traffic to know when to go. So keep that in mind. And I am on the elderly and disabled transportation advisory committee. And I hope that you will bring this to the committee. That's all I have, thank you. Thank you, Janet, I'm glad that worked. Um, well, and nobody else online. There are no other speakers, Mayor. Uh, man, do we have any other comments on this? I have comments. Yeah, go for it. Thanks. Sorry. Thanks. Um, I would just say, I mean, looking at these comparison charts supplied by staff who are the experts on this subject, uh, it seems very clear that the roundabout is the way to go if you compare it to the signal or the road diet. And I would just um, defer to the experts on this subject. So I'd be very prepared to move forward with that. Okay. Um, so I would somewhat agree with that. Yes, they are the experts. Um, however, my concerns are that we're not addressing the bike safety issues 
that we see up and down Bay Avenue with the students going from the high school to the middle school to the elementary school. They're all on bikes, and I'm concerned that the roundabout doesn't address that um, in, in a way that I like to see it. We're already dealing with tons of kids on bikes and safety issues already that we, we are trying to figure out how to manage, and I don't see any of these addressing that. Similarly to the seniors, um, we've received multiple emails about safety um, for our seniors from the Bay Avenue Senior Center crossing, and I don't really see how any of these address that. Um, and to our speaker's point, there are multiple cut, uh, driveways that aren't being um, reviewed as well in, in this study, and so I'd like more input on that. Um, I think that all of the, you know, when we asked for the study, at least for, for when I asked for the study, I didn't envision something so excessive. I really thought that we would find some sort of happy median in terms of um, dealing with the collisions. You shared that there were 16 collisions in the last seven years or so. Um, but I'd like to know on an intersection like that across of that, um, you showed in Capitola, but is that average in other cities with that kind of um, four-way stop? Um, if that's kind of average for what it is, what are some of the other remedies um, that are less, less excessive? I'm really concerned that we're not looking at the whole Bay Avenue corridor. Reducing lanes, for me, is a big problem, especially when we have 10,000 people coming into town for huge events like our, our in cultural over one weekend and trying to get in and out. Um, I'm thinking about our garbage trucks going up and down that Bay Avenue road. How does that impact them with less roads? Um, so I'd like to see a longer term plan that's cohesive for the entire Bay Avenue stretch, not so much just this. And I know we wanna address it, but I'm just deeply concerned that we're just looking at, we only ask Kim Horn to look at that four way stop, which makes sense, because that's what we asked for. But um, I'm really concerned about our pedestrian and bike safety. Those are, which I see every single day, kids walking and riding bikes. And um, I'm, I'm not seeing any of these really highlighting how that's going to alleviate or keep them safer. So today I'm not prepared to make any motions moving forward with any of these um, as, or not a motion, you're just seeking recommendations. So I'm... I wouldn't be prepared on moving any recommendations forward without seeing more information coming back to us. Um, maybe we can move over, move forward with Council Member Browns with a committee or something like that. But as of today, I'm not prepared to to make any uh, recommendation or approve any of these recommendations from Kimberly Horn today. No, I, I think it is time that we we do something with all the problems we've had with the traffic. Um, so I think that. The diet is probably the way to go. Although the futures, the roundabouts are, are going to be coming everywhere in California. At least we're doing something. Uh, I think it's it's positive, and uh, whatever we can do to make it safer. So I, I think recommending the diet is and moving forward is a good idea. We have another question. The quick build road diet is that um, easily removed? If it just doesn't, if we did this for like six months and it's just terrible and everyone hates it, could we just get rid of it? I mean, yeah, that is part of the point of using temporary materials. Yeah, I think I'll chime in on that part. Is I, I do feel like something needs to be done and that, that the road diet is something that's already budgeted and could, we, we don't know enough because we don't have the roundabout up at Gales and we don't know what that's gonna look like. So that's why I feel like having something sort of temporary in the interim, um, I think it does speak somewhat to pedestrian safety only because it is shortening the crosswalks. Um, so I, yeah, I wouldn't move forward with a roundabout. Um, I would say trying to implement some of these quick fixes in a way that are budgeted for before we see what is actually gonna happen with the rest of the avenue. That's my take. Yeah, I guess I would just caution us to think about um, taking away lanes 
and not seeing a full plan. I heard Council Member Brown asking questions, Council Member Clark bringing up pedestrian savings for our seniors. I am, um, rather than us moving forward with that proposal, I would like to see staff come back with more information on addressing our concerns before initiating any um, anything, even if it's the road diet, which seems to be kind of the middle ground, um, just because we all have concerns, I'm hearing all of us say, um, and I just like staff to address them, and then we can have a more robust conversation. And I appreciate Councilmember Peterson's thought, you know, they are the experts, so I would want to hear from the experts saying to me, yes, Councilmember Brooks, you know, the bikes are going to go here, this is how they're going to, this is going to be, this is what the plan is, this is how we're going to go talk to the kids, this is what PD is going to do, all of those things. But I'm not hearing that. And the last thing I want to hear from our community is why did you take away one of our lanes? <laughs> um, because, and I, and especially from Roundtree here, without a robust plan, I don't, I don't see us that making any sense to me. So, so I, I think, yeah. Um, I just wanted to touch on the pedestrian safety because based on the, um, what we got from staff, the roundabout does mention that and say that it is the safest option, which is a very big priority given the um, accidents that have happened and the um, closeness to the senior housing there. Uh, and it also says that it is the most efficient at traffic flow. So while it is removing a lane, if we are to trust the staff report that we were provided, that will be the most efficient means of moving traffic. So that, that's what I'm basing um, my comments off of. But having said that, I, I'm not opposed to learning more about the situation. I do believe community involvement would be really important. I would like to hear what the um, disabled and elderly committee on the RTC has to say about it. Um, but it, it just, it still seems clear to me that the roundabout is the most efficient for a number of reasons um, in almost every category from what we were provided by staff. One thing that is missing that you did mention, um, it doesn't explicitly state um, bicycle safety, which I would also be interested in, in hearing about. Yeah, and long-term plans for the rest of Bay Avenue. That's what's also really missing from this um, meeting. So this is just addressing Bay Avenue right in front of Knob Hill, but it's not looking at the additional roundabout being proposed over by Gales. And so if you have two, how does that impact? What is the flow for, you know, the green striping going down the entire Bay Avenue? Like all of those components are missing to this kind of story of us, the, the problems we're trying to solve here. Um, so that's just an element. Hopefully that's not. <laughs> um, so I think that's another component is this long-term strategy, which is in the report today. There's short-term and long-term, but that's a big component for me in making any of these decisions um, tonight. And our city manager did mention there are kind of, these were conceptual designs on the um, road diet, and so maybe it's a matter, maybe it's a matter of, I'm <laughs> they're laughing back there, um, maybe it's a matter of seeing what the four different road diet designs would look like and coming back to us and after we've gotten feedback or the three or whatever that would look like. Um, I just like to see that before approving anything. Yeah, I agree. So I think um, if we're able to see options of the road diet, but focus on um, where those bike lanes are going to be and how they're going to be either illuminated or just made obvious and things like that, maybe just making sure that we're getting a little bit fuller detail as far as like, like let's pull that scope of that picture out a little bit and really see like up to center and back towards the senior center and things like that. Um, so that maybe something temporary, that's a quick fix we could agree on for right now so that we're not moving forward on a huge roundabout decision before the other one is started either, you know? Um, so I, I think we need staff to come back. So based on what I'm hearing, I think it sounds like that there's 
basic consensus around at least looking at a quick build project. And the question becomes is, do you want to come back to a meeting where we bring more information? Uh, Council Member Brown brought up an idea of having a subcommittee potentially working with staff uh, to develop a final plan that would come back to the council for a thumbs up or thumbs down vote. So I think those might be your two cleanest options uh, at this stage is either say, come back to the full council with some more answers to these questions you just identified, Mayor Kaiser, or form a little subcommittee, can work with staff, we can work with the property owners and the neighbors and come back, develop a, a quick build project uh, for council consideration. So I think those might be your two cleanest options right now based on what I'm hearing. What sounds the most appealing? I mean, I think it's best if we had like a committee with council input and the property owner input and all that, but I'm saying that as someone who won't be able to volunteer for it, so. <laughs> What do you mean? You're busy or something? Yeah, I don't know. I can't. <laughs> yes. Um. <laughs> oh, I, thought you were I thought you were raising your hands. Just, just 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 offering up your hand. 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 We don't want to have happen what happened on Portola Drive. That was a mess. Oh. When they did their yeah. calming. Oh, um, mm -hmm. so we don't want to have that. So we need, to do, we need to get input from the business owners and the people that are actually going to be using it. So you would be on the committee? Yeah. Okay. I'm not volunteering for the committee, but I would hope that we can move this along quickly because I know um, some of the senior residents have been asking. I've heard this from multiple residents uh, on that property um, nearly a year ago, and I'm sure that this has been got an ongoing issue, and somebody was just injured last month. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't... Have consulted about a roundabout? We haven't held any community meetings about roundabouts. That, that is one of the things that I think Director Khan may have mentioned during the presentation is, is that we do have a planned, more robust sort of workshop with the council plan for this fall to talk about roundabouts and some of the details that we talked about, but we haven't done that yet. Well, then should we even form a council committee until the public has given us feedback on their preferences? Because otherwise we're, it, we're just kind of spinning our wheels on what we think is best and we haven't heard from anyone in the public yet. I was suggesting that the committee would be focused on the quick build project. If the council wants to go in that direction. And right. it sounds like for the time being, we put longer term plans on hold. We focus on getting something done in the near term. No, that's not what I'm, I, I wouldn't agree with that. It was that's not what you're, that was, was you. Simple. Yeah, I, that's not what council is saying. I think what council is saying that we have not heard from the community. We haven't received feedback. This is coming to us for the first time and we haven't, talk to anybody about what they wanted. Um, so I would agree with Council Member Brown on this, that we need to seek community input, share some of these ideas with them. You can maybe form a committee council with Council Member Clark if we need it, and then come back to council with, with their thoughts on, on these options, and then we can have a more robust conversation about it. Okay, about how about it. this? How about we put together the committee, we have the council members, we look at the quick build option, not the roundabout option right now, we look at the quick build option, Consider what our problem, our problems and our concerns are, and with that, put together some kind of presentation that we can do to the Bay Avenue Senior Center or business owners, people in in that specific area, and then bring that feedback from the committee's recommendations to the council to decide what to do with. Does that make sense? I think so. Does that include a refined design? I think that's what the committee would decide, yeah. The quick build? Yeah. I mean, that's something the committee would look at, right? Yeah, that's what my understanding was. Yeah, yeah. yeah. How many meetings would this committee have? I'd be happy to participate. All right. Okay, so we're going to create a subcommittee of Councilmember Peterson and Councilmember Clark, along with, no, don't have to do that. My suggestion is that the subcommittee um, comprise solely Councilmember Peterson and Councilmember Clark, because then it's an ad hoc committee under the Brown Act. Got it. Okay. And then if the subcommittee needs staff to assist, you could certainly ask for that help from staff. And if you would like to talk to the community, you could certainly 
talk to the community and report back to your fellow council members. So I would suggest the motion be a um, motion to form an ad hoc subcommittee um, of council member Clark and council member Peterson. Can I play off of that um, a little bit to provide direction to staff regarding short-term and long-term options for improving traffic safety at the intersection of Bay Avenue and Hill Street that will come back to council at a further date? So is that what the ad hoc committee will do? Great. Okay. So um, I'd like to make a motion to um, create an ad hoc committee with Council Member Clark and Council Member Peterson and at their discretion to invite public, um, uh, uh, not public, um, businesses and partners to provide direction to staff regarding short-term and long-term options for improving traffic safety at the intersection of Bay Avenue and Hill Street and they will return back to council with further comments or a report, not further comments, a report. Would you guys well, like second. Sorry, I, thought, <laughs> I, I didn't realize that was a motion. I'll second. Can I request some clarification? Yeah. So would we be developing sort of a, based on the community feedback, the neighbor input, the council input through the ad hoc committee, would be developing a, recommended near-term plan? Is that the outcome? Or are we coming back with just the results of that outreach? So short-term and long-term options is what the ad hoc kit committee is going to come back to council with. So we've received long-term and short-term based off of Kimberly Horn, but that was without any business or community input on what they want. And so I'm really concerned. I am really interested in getting that information first before making any decision on a whatever that thing was called. The roundabout. No, the other one. Road comedy. Road diet. road diet. <laughs> the road diet. Yeah, I don't want to move forward with anything until we get feedback from them. I'm having flashbacks to the jewel box. I know. I'm not sure why this is so confusing. I don't. I think we need more more public input before we make any decisions on on that on this. I, I hear you. It wasn't what I was hearing from the full council earlier, but this motion is it's crystallized for me. I think one of the things, though, is that the two meeting promise is probably not. I don't know that we can uh, stick to that if we're talking about long term, kind of a long term visioning strategy for Bay Avenue. That sounds like that's more of a project. I'm sorry when I was talking about. Two meetings, I was thinking we were pretty much focused on just a near-term project and trying to figure out how that was going to look. Well, then let's focus well, on the near-term. Yeah, I mean, because we can focus on the near-term, and then as the long-term comes, then we can have another public outreach process. That'll be much longer. If we're going to have the, the roundabout in front of Gales potentially done by summer next year, then that would be a good time for us to look at long-term. Mm -hmm. Because that's already set in stone, right? That's already happening. Well, well, it's not funded, and I think that there's still discussion in the, the council about whether we're going to move forward on that one, but. Okay, yeah. so I'll amend my motion and take out the word long-term <laughs> and just leave short-term. I'd also like to direct staff to look at the long-term effects for the entire Bay Avenue stretch with the potential of two roundabouts because that's what we're talking about in the long term. And so we might as well just put that on the docket for a future agenda item come next year, four months from now or whenever, but I'd like to direct staff to do that. I've amended the motion, is that? I will accept the amendment. Thank you, Council Member Brown. Is that what I, because I seconded it, I just need to accept that it's been amended. Mm -hmm. Cool, all right. Got a first and a second. Let's do a roll call. Councilmember Brooks. Aye. Councilmember Clark. Aye. Councilmember Peterson. Aye. Vice Mayor Brown. Aye. And Mayor Kaiser. Aye. Thank you. Passes unanimously. Thank you. Alrighty. We've got 9C, City Council appointments to advisory bodies. Recommended action is to appoint members of the public to the City of Capitola Commission on the Environment. 
Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. To finish off our meeting tonight, we do have a potential appointment to the Commission on the Environment. So the previously adopted administrative policy I-38 allows youth participation on city advisory bodies. All terms for youth participants are for one year and it's meant to coincide with the school year. The position is a non-voting position on the advisory body and it will not count towards the quorum of the body. The Commission on the Environment recently received one application. The application was reviewed by the commission in accordance with their bylaws and that commission does not currently have any youth members on board. The applicant is called Tucker Grassell. He um, attended the COE meeting on September 20th, and the COE met, reviewed the application, and recommends that the city council appoint this youth member. So the recommended action this evening is to appoint Tucker as a youth member to the Commission on the Environment for a one-year term in accordance with our administrative policy. I'm available for any questions. Questions? I have. Kind of a question, it probably isn't appropriate for this, but I'm curious why the youth members are non-voting members. Maybe that's something we could talk about outside this meeting, is that? You can go ahead. So typically youth members are minors, mm -hmm. um, and some of our administrative bodies have legislative authority for the city, and it's, it's I'm not always recommended for minors to have voting decision on use of city funds or city projects. Um, they're also not always able to attend all meetings because of school commitments. The policy is, was created to encourage participation and provide experience on government agency bodies um, without conflicting with their school priorities because it's a recognition that the school priority should come first. So it's really meant to encourage kind of an introduction to government without over committing a youth member to something that they might not be able to join. All of our city advisory bodies have an attendance policy as well. So if it was a voting member and it did contribute to the quorum, they would be required to attend a certain number of meetings and that wouldn't be feasible if they're a minor um, and have school commitments. Okay, so minors are not for um, actual membership on these committees, is that true? They are, they just can't vote. I know, but they're, like... They're ex officio members. Yeah, like vote, voting members. Minors are not eligible to become voting members on any of our committees. Is that correct? So I actually don't know whether or not you could have a minor that was appointed to a regular seat. Um, I think that's something we could look into. The As our city clerk was elaborating, the... The program to add minor representative to each one of the boards and commissions, we put a fair bit of thought into that when we were developing it. And one of the concerns was about ensuring that the boards and commissions could maintain a, uh, a quorum so that they could meet. And so we came up with this sort of the ex officio position so that it didn't count against the overall quorum. Um, I don't know whether or not we could have a minor in a regular board and commission role, given that they're minors and then the probably not the age that they could vote. It's something we could look into and I can let you know what I find. I'd also be curious to know if... Uh, Julia does answer that question. She says, she just said that they can't. So I, isn't that... They can't. They can't. She just answered that question. I have never heard of any city that allows a minor to join a group outside of like a youth advisory commission. Some cities do have youth member groups where all members are like under the age of 18, for example, or high school seniors would be like the last category of youth member. But typically it's not considered a best practice. And I'm not sure if there's a legal requirement for this, but it's not considered a best practice to allow minors to vote on decisions that could impact the city or make recommendations to the city council unless it, like I said, it was a youth advisory group. Any other questions? Any public comment? Here or there? Anywhere? Back to council. What are our thoughts? I think it's a great idea to have youth on our commissions. Um, I know Tucker and his family. I think he'd be great. And uh, if we're ready, I can make a motion. Yeah, I'll second that. I have some comments as well. Great. First and a second, but we'll take comments first. Ironically, um, Sometimes when you post things on Facebook, it reminds you later that you posted them. Six years ago today, you posted this, and six years ago today, 
uh, the council approved the policy that I brought forward to ask for youth boards, uh, youth seats on the board. So Tucker is being appointed on the six year anniversary of us even allowing youth to be on any of our boards and commissions. So it's a fun thing, fun little trivia fact. Um, Tucker, if I'm not mistaken, I met at the CWEP um, community meeting over at uh, New Brighton and he was just brilliant young man and got up and presented and he was, you know, very eloquent and, and prepared and, and uh, you know, I approached him and told him you should really consider being on one of our boards and I'm really excited to see um, that he has decided to apply for uh, for this seat. So really excited for him and, and looking forward to um, the contribution that he has to make to our city. Great. May we have a roll call? Sure. Councilmember Brooks? Aye. Councilmember Clark? Aye. Councilmember Peterson? Aye. Vice Mayor Brown? Aye. And Mayor Kaiser? Aye. Passes unanimously. Takes us to our last item of business today. Number 10, which is adjournment. Thank you everybody so much. Cheers. Cheers.